Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You are here. All right, the announcements. You can see most of them up there. Our weekly events are all on for this week. The blanket drive deadline is December 11th. That's two weeks from today. So if you are thinking about, hi guys. <laughs> if you are thinking about bringing in a blanket, make sure you get it here by the 11th. There is no youth group today. Nobody's excited about no youth group. <laughs> and the candlelight service, December 23rd at 7 p.m. here. And I imagine, uh, has, where's Dan? Did we invite Beaver? Uh, they're having their own. Ah, okay. So All no, right. No. <laughs> so no, we didn't invite him. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we are, <clears throat> how, do you, how do we express our gratitude? For being part of the family of God. How do we express our gratitude for the opportunity and the freedom to gather together like this? To honor and glorify your name. To sing songs and to hear the word preached. God, I pray that you would stir our hearts to worship this morning. That we would not miss out. That we would feel your love and your mercy extended toward us, God, that we would reflect that glory back to you. Have your way this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Would you all please stand as you are able and join us in singing, Blessed Be Your Name. This will get you motivated. Blessed be your name in the land that is wonderful.
Amen. All glory be to Christ <coughs> in the tune of Old Lang Syne. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. to feel your heartbeat, 
I can feel mine right now, but I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> Mine's beating, but feel your heartbeat. Just again and again and again. And just know that each one of those is an absolute gift from your God. Every one. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. As called out ones, we have been given grace. As called out ones, we have been given mercy. And we have been bought with a price. We have been redeemed. All glory be to Christ. <clears throat> we worship him, for he alone is worthy of our worship. All glory be to Christ. Thanks, Mark. In Romans, uh, Romans 12, the verse 36 is behind us. We're going to back up a little bit and just uh, a, an obvious reminder of who God is and, and why we should worship him. Romans 12, 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. A verse is on our wall and allow yourself to be distracted by it. It tells us so much about him, and the emphasis is on him, and we are here to worship him. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And, and a simple phrase to tie that together is that he is God, and we are not. Let's pray together. Lord God, our Father, our Creator, we worship you, for you are worthy of our worship. Nothing is too difficult for you. We thank you, we praise you, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, we, we, we are here before you as children, as your children, whom you have chosen as your own. And we thank you for that. We love you for that. And we pray to the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Link. And as we continue our worship, would you please stand and join with us in singing, Take My Life and Let It Be.
hymns have such great lyrics. Take time to be holy. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God, and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, 
Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, the sweetness and the magnificence of the gospel I pray, dear God, that that would always be seen with bright, shiny luster to it for us, Lord. That we wouldn't, we wouldn't come to the truth of the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, ruling and reigning and return. God, that that, that, that message would not lose its, its beauty to us. But dear God, it would increase as we consider the gospel message, as we consider how salvation has been accomplished, and all that was done, all that was foretold, all that was accomplished is being accomplished, and what will be accomplished, God, as we just contemplate all of that, it would leave us in a place where we are ready, willing, excited to bow before you in awe of what you've done. Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinful man in need of mercy and in need of great grace and righteousness that's not my own. And Lord, I've received everything at your hand. So Father, as we return to a familiar text this morning, I pray that by way of reminder, you would refresh our souls of who we are apart from Jesus and who we are in Jesus. And that, Lord, that would result in hearts that love you, adore you, and wish to worship you. So stir us from your word, I pray. Use, may your spirit use your word in the life of your people for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you sin this week? <laughs> Gluttony? I mean, anything on there? <clears throat> Every now and again, it's funny just to stop and contemplate what it'd be like to not sin. Just a day. Just one day. No, no sin. No weird temper. No uh, outburst of frustration. No lustful thought. One day. A whole day. Sin-free. Unbroken communion with God. Nothing that gets between he and I, nothing that gets between my wife and I, nothing that gets between my brothers, my sisters, this world and I. Just sin free for a day. Be magnificent. I don't know that world. I don't know that guy. Every time I look in the mirror, it's a sinner that keeps looking back at me. But it's, I think it does us good to stop and just think about Adam and Eve's life prior to to the fall in Genesis 3. And think about what the relationship was like. I, I don't have, I don't believe that it was a very long time before sin came in, but I don't know that necessarily. But within that time frame, sin-free, joy, unbroken fellowship with God, and ease. As Brother Mark just said, I, I look forward to that. I'm excited for that. What's interesting is that the longer you're a Christian, the more your sin does start to bother you more and more and more. At first, you're thankful that God saved you. Then you grow in your faith a little bit more. Then you're really surprised he would do that. Then you grow more and more, and you just, just can't believe he would do that. 
And the longer you become a believer, the more God graciously allows you to see your sin rightly before him. You write songs like Amazing Grace. Not boring grace, not pretty good grace, but you truly are amazed. You're in awe of your grace because of the sin you know that is, has, has been in your heart. Um, the reason Mark lit this candle is, this is totally arbitrary, so let me just own that off the bat, but we light a candle each Sunday as kind of a touchstone throughout redemptive history, moving to, towards the first advent of the Lord Jesus. And I pick them arbitrarily because I, it's fun, um, but also as I walk through redemptive history, I see Genesis chapter 3, I see the foretelling of Christ in the patriarchs, the foretelling of Christ in the prophets, the foretelling of Christ in the Psalms, the foretelling of Christ in the people who were there right before Jesus came, Joseph and Mary and Simeon and so on and so forth. And so I'll be preaching through some of those touchstones for the rest of December. Um, we'll be back in Genesis 37, yeah, 37, uh, in, in next year. So, Genesis chapter 3 this morning. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 15 is the target I'm going after, but I want us to look at the first 14 verses that come up prior to that, all right? So, look with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Well, verse 24 of chapter 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, this is very interesting, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that there and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, Yes, I did, and it's all my fault. <laughs> The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly, um, being that we went through this just three years ago. <laughs> <clears throat> The serpent being more crafty, uh, just a cross-reference for you if you're keeping notes, write down Revelation 12, 9, speaking to this concept of him as a serpent. We hear this later. Satan was allowed to come within the bounds of the garden, and Satan very subtly attacked the word. Satan very subtly attacked the word. 
Now, what's fascinating to me is that in the very context of this passage, we hear about the Word of God being questioned. What's fascinating to me is that in our context, in our world right now, it's being questioned that this ever even happened, that this is actual uh, historical narrative, that Adam was a legit historical figure. And people make all kinds of jokes about the two teenagers in the garden and the talking snake, and it's their way of poking fun at you foolish Christians for, you actually believe that? You know how ridiculous that is? Blah, blah, blah. Try to throw shame on you. Well, this is the inerrant, inspired word of God. There's no reason to take this as figurative language. I believe it absolutely is narrative, but I don't, I'm not just giving Dan's opinion. Jesus spoke of Adam and Eve and spoke about these passages as true historical narrative. The Apostle Paul absolutely did as well. All the apostles did, so I'm banking on the interpretation of God in the flesh. Pretty safe, I think. And so what we have here is actually the beginning of, of sin in mankind. Not the beginning of sin, that's to be further before this, but the beginning of sin in mankind. Now here's what is overwhelming, as I've just been thinking about this passage this week. Think of every single sin ever. All human history. Every single transgression against God ever committed. And, and, and what it feels like is like a like a, a weight, a real heavy weight that kind of sets on your shoulders when you think of just every single time God has been utterly transgressed against. And in this moment, we have the very beginning in mankind with Adam and Eve. <clears throat> now, I was thinking about this concept of the questioning of God's word, because the first thing that Satan comes with is, did God really say? Did God actually say that? And what I started thinking about, because the statement that I planned on making was, we need to be very careful when we question God's word. Well, and that's true, but at the same time, there's two kinds of ways of questioning God's word. Um, I, I thoroughly encourage my own, my own heart, my kids, you guys, I encourage everybody to question the word of God. But you're quite, I mean that in reference to, like, asking a professor for greater clarity on that which he's teaching. When you come to the Word of God and you say, man, I don't know what that means, I'm not exactly sure how that is, how can that be? How can, how can, how can God sovereignly elect unto salvation, and how can man be held accountable for what he does with the gospel? How do those two work? And by the way, when you figure that out, send me an email. <clears throat> It's good to question God's word. It's, it's right. It's, it's good for the soul. It's good for the heart. It's good for the mind to come to God's word and poke questions at it, poke questions at it. But in the sense of asking clarity from the professor, as opposed to what Satan's doing here, where it's actually asking questions of the parent to find out if you can find some way of getting out of that which you've been told to do. So what's the difference? Motive. The motive is the difference. One is, God, I want to know that which you've said. I want to have a clear understanding of that which you've communicated. Would you help me? The other one is, I really don't want to walk in obedience. Is there some way that I could twist this and get away with it? That I might justify my sin. I was having dinner with um, somebody an unsaved man, and, and uh, he made this statement. And as I heard him say it, it, was, it just kind of caught me off guard. He said, he was talking about in the 70s, and he said that was when it was still sin to live with your wife, live with your girlfriend before you get married. And I'm sitting there going, when did that stop? <laughs> <clears throat> but the, in his mind, the way he was communicating it was, we decide what's sin, we decide what's not sin. You go to God's word, yeah, that's an old book, it's kind of dusty, it's hard, it's up to your own interpretation. That's true for you, not really true for me. That's not really how I interpret the old book, blah, blah, blah. And you make it so fuzzy, so um, imprecise, that you can just basically say, that's not what I think it says. So therefore, I'm good to go. Beloved, 
there is a there's a root process here that that or a root system here that we must recognize and recognize with great clarity. I'm sure many of you, if at all, of you have. But the questioning of God's word in that respect is the beginning of great folly. With the idea of maybe the Bible doesn't mean that. So that way I can do this. You see the difference in motive as opposed to, Lord, whatever I find in your word and I see it clearly, I will seek to walk in obedience. But I don't understand what this says. I'm struggling. Give me greater clarity that I may walk in clearer obedience. That's a good way to question God's word. That's a Berean type way of, of testing the scriptures to see, do I, do, is this really what the Bible teaches? Praise God. But that's not what's happening here. What's happening here, and what I, what I find so fascinating, is the subtlety. The subtlety. Did he really say that? Did God really create male and female? What really makes gender? Is homosexuality really sinful? I mean, I realize in the Old Testament back when things were different, yeah, it was kind of seen like that, but, but come on, we're smarter now, we're wiser now. I heard one quote-unquote pastor say that God has always embraced homosexuality and we're catching up to him. That stuff's out there. You hear it. I hear it. And what's so fascinating is I keep coming back to chapter 3 in Genesis. Did God really say? Are you sure about that? Not only that, but in the midst of the questioning of God's word, you get tremendous social pressure to buckle on this one. Fill in the blank, whatever this one is. Are you sure that's what the word says? Perhaps your interpretation is a bit too wooden, and you need to flex a little bit more. Well, here's the history, um, beloved. The subtlety of the questioning of God's word for the sake of disobeying God's word began here, and it is just smack dab in the middle of our world. This is not new. That's what's so fascinating, is it not, that we say, well, now we understand what the Bible says. No, you're just second-guessing it exactly like Satan did. Nothing new. Just sinful nature, wanting to get under the law, wanting to get under, under God's command, so that way I don't have to worry about it. And so he comes, and notice that he does not approach Adam, the leader in the marriage, the one whom the woman came from, the one who's in charge of tending and keeping the garden. He goes to Eve, his wife, and ignores the husband. Now, I realize in the passage it says that Adam was there. Uh, I, I believe that. I believe he was present. I believe that he absolutely abdicated his responsibility here. But regardless, look at the tactics of the enemy. He said to the woman, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Now, guys, there's something very interesting, even in how he does this, in the sense of subtlety. Please notice, as you read through the passage, his, his, um, his focus is completely on that which is withheld, and there's zero focus on that which has been provided. Notice he does not say, did God actually say, you can't eat of that tree, Simultaneously, but he gave you every other tree. Abundance for the rest of your life with complete joy. No, he's not going to talk like that. It's kind of like the kid that comes and asks his dad for a popsicle. Dad gives him a popsicle. <clears throat> Next day, dad, can I have a popsicle? <clears throat> you bet. Next day, dad, can I have a popsicle? You bet. Next day, dad, can I have a popsicle? No, not today, son. You never give me anything. The focus on that which is being withheld with no concept, no thought process about that which is being provided. You know what we call this, what Satan's doing here? This is manipulation. He's manipulating here. He's structuring it in such a way that he will make God sound stingy, make himself sound wise and generous, and make her feel and sense to be 
in title. Now, just <laughs> let that soak. Think about the very culture we live in right now. Where those who are generous are made out to be stingy, those who are stingy made out to be generous, and everybody is entitled to everything they could have ever imagined. He knows exactly what he's doing here. Eve listens to Satan. Adam listens to Eve. Nobody listens to God. It's devastating. But i got to give Eve some credit because she sought to combat him at first. Look at your Bible. <clears throat> Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. She sought her best to combat him with the truth. Now, Notice there's a little piece added there, never said by God, or at least never recorded that God said that neither shall you touch it lest you die. Was that something that Adam told her? Or is it something that she's adding there because now she's actually starting to buy into the idea that God's stingy? I don't know the answer to the question. I just find it fascinating that Satan comes, questions God's word. She does her best to respond by restating God's word, makes it more strict than what we see stated earlier. Not only that, she says, lest you die, instead of you shall surely die. You see how things are changing here? And what did this begin with? This is what we gotta, we shouldn't miss this at all, beloved. What, what does this all begin with? Is that really what God said? That's, that's, the, that, that's the, the hinge that this whole discourse here is, tur is turning on of the questioning of God and his holy word. And now verse 4. But Satan, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So first questioning, confusing, and now outright denying. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. No, <laughs> So fascinating that the one who wanted to be like God and was thrown down and humiliated is now coming to her with the same temptation, you will be like God. Now, we are utterly mistaken if we think that this is a temptation simply struggling, or that Satan struggled with, or that Adam and Eve struggled with. Have you ever heard the phrase that man is the measure of all things? The humanist mantra. Beloved, this is, again, this, this root system I've been speaking about, it's, it's all here. It, it is so interesting to just look at our culture, not just our culture, but our world, and come back to Genesis 3 and look at the, the sins of our world and all the little sins that come off the, the larger sins, if you will, and it all comes back to chapter 3. Questioning of God's word, denial of God's word, competition with God for who is superior, and who gets the glory? It's all here. Outright denial of his word. Yeah, I know that anytime somebody says, I get really nervous when somebody goes, I know the Bible says, but... Stop. Stop. If you know that's what it says, and you know that that's what it means, the discussion just stops. And I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying we don't sin, I'm not saying anything, I'm just saying, well, if you know that's what it says, you know that's what it means, then you say, but I, no, stop, in your tracks, and ask, why are you talking now, if you know that's what it says, and you know that's what it means. But see, the tough part, beloved, is that the first struggle in this very discourse is she's listening to him. And now he's got her. And now she feels a temptation. And there's, there's bits here theologically I just wrestle with, and I know I'll always wrestle with as far as the nature of mankind, sin-free, yet tempted. And how all that is pieced together. Now, look down at your Bibles. <clears throat> Uh, again, you will be like gods, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was good to, good to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. So I see nothing in the text that tells me in the midst of the conversation, Adam walked in and goes, hey, get the snake out of here. I don't see anything in there. The text seems to lend itself to the thought that he's with her during this discourse. What's he doing? Um, apparently being silent, receiving fruit, eating the fruit. And what's so fascinating is in the New Testament, for, you know, just turn there with me. We'll be right back to chapter 3. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. This is in the context of church government, in the context of church structure. Verse 12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Verse 13 Four, so he goes all the way back to the creation to make his, his, make his argument here in reference to teaching in the church. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now listen to this little insight we're given. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Adam not deceived, but the woman was deceived. So what do we know all we know from the ink in our Bible is that there was a deception that was functioning well over Eve. Adam was not deceived, but willfully engaged in this decision to eat and disobey the word of God, the command of God. And all through your New Testament, you hear how we died in Adam. Over and over again, Adam, 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 never Eve. <clears throat> Just an interesting point that must be made known, because some folks, you know, this lame joke that Eve did it, and it was Eve's fault, blah, blah, blah. The, the scripture confronts that pretty head on, very head on. But this is on Adam. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So at some point during lunch today, I'm going to be with all my family back there. It's interesting to ask the question, what did he hear? All we we're told that he, he heard the sound of God walking and coming closer. I've never heard... I've heard lots of answers, but I've never heard one that made me say, hey, aha, that's true, in reference to the sound of God walking, coming. When I was a little kid reading this text, for some reason, all I could ever think was the little glass from Jurassic Park when the dinosaur crushed and he saw the water jiggle. But I don't think that's what it was. I don't know what it was. But there was a sound, and Adam knew he's coming. Now, Follow along. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man was with his wife, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It's one of the saddest moments in your Bible. And we've seen some pretty sad moments in our Bible going through Genesis. But one of the saddest, most heartbreaking moments in your Bible is they hide from God. The Father, the Creator, the love, the, the, who has loved them, who they love. This is the most dearest relationship, unbroken, sweet, fresh communion with the living God. And for the very first time, he's coming. Let's hide. And thinking about the emotion in their heart where they know we have gone against him, we have conflict with him. We're at odds with him. He's no doubt going to be at odds with us. Let us hide from him. And in the stupidity of sin, they hide themselves from the omnipresent God. To think of the marring of the relationship between God and man in this passage is absolutely breathtaking. 
I don't know about you, but I needed to be told I was a sinner. Now, what I mean by that is, I was a sinner. I'm a sinner. But as I came to Christ and read my Bible, I was informed that, wow, I was a sinner from birth. Dead in Adam. A sinner. Lost. Needed, in need of redemption. Adam and Eve were the only ones that went from righteousness to lost in sin. Dead in sin. In that transformation, in that moment. So they actually know that now things have changed. Things are different. Things will forever be different. And for the first time in their lives, they hid from their creator. God called out to them for their sake. Remember, he knew their location. These two sinless people were now in the middle of blaming and accusing. Look down at your Bible and follow along. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? God knows where he is. Remember, just like any good parent, he sees the two little feet under the couch, and he goes, Danny, where are you? Right? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, I would love to read Adam's response be, I did. I'm not saying that, therefore, he wouldn't be condemned. I'm not saying there wouldn't be sin. I understand all that. But I would just love to read the text where his response is, I did. I directly, consciously sinned against you, Lord. And take the hit like a man. But that's not how sin works, right? Sin is shameless. Sin is dirty. Sin is um, gutless. There's no courage in sin. You know what we do in sin? We blame. Integrity takes the hit when they do wrong. Sin looks for the nearest person they could blame. Well, there's not too many other persons for him to blame. And so his immediate action, the very first action to come to this man, this freshly fallen sinful man, the first thing to come to his mind is it's Eve. Then he takes it even farther than this. Look down. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Now, beloved, think of every single sin that's ever been accomplished ever in all of history. How many of those sins are a result of not wanting to take the blame and to give it to somebody else? You're entitled. It's not your fault. Oh, that's not my fault. You misunderstood. I didn't do that. I misspoke. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Sorry. Over and over and over and over again. Again, this root system that we can look at right now, 2022, we can look around and go, man, that's exactly like Adam and Eve. No responsibility, no integrity, no character. Just, it's, it's your fault, God. You gave me this woman. This woman that you gave to me, she gave it to me, and then, you know, I was, I was just, what else am I supposed to do? I just ate. <laughs> And what I love is the Lord, the Lord doesn't go down that rabbit hole. He just goes to the woman then. Okay, well, let's talk to this horrible woman that did this. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The sad part, beloved, is that the accusation from Adam, to some extent, is true. The accusation from Eve, to some extent, is true. But that's not the point. The point is, they had a decision, they had a choice, and, and they did not act in faith in God. They did not act in obedience to God's word. His word was questioned and then canceled, and now completely disregarded. The doctrine of original sin, as theologians coined it, 
This concept of what took place at the fall in the fallen sinfulness of man that now happened after chapter 3 in all men, to the point David says, in, uh, in sin my mother conceived me. The scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture tells us that no man seeks after God. All have turned aside. You are dead, backbiters, haters of God. These are, these are just the crushing statements. You see the statement about the sinfulness of man before the flood. You see the sinfulness of the statement about man after the flood. You go through, and even the good guys, quote unquote, David and Solomon and all these people that we say, these are some of the Bible heroes. Uh, I, let me show you some passages of these heroes. They're still lost sinners in need of redemption. Just like you, just like me. See, this is the grand mistake, historically speaking. Incredible false doctrines flow from a disregard of what happened in chapter 3. To where we want to give man a lighter way out. The New Testament just levels mankind in its description of who we are by nature. And we want to say, no, they're not dead in sins and trespasses, they're ill. No, they're not. They're dead in sins and trespasses. They're fallen. They're sinners. They're lost. They're in need of redemption. There is no hope apart from the new birth. And that's the whole discussion in the passage I, I started with in Romans 5, is that we have died in Adam. And so, beloved, as we let that sink in, that alters our theological understanding of the rest of the Word of God. And so if your understanding of mankind is that he's basically good, that will, that will trash your understanding of the rest of the world. It's a, it's a foundational principle that if, if mankind is seen in his sin wrongly, everything you build on that foundation is eventually just going to crumble. And it has all throughout history. Certain preachers and teachers and theologians who have run wild with the thought that to the point, one theologian made reference to, we all have a garden experience where we fall. No, that's not what the word says. The word says that we have already all fallen in Adam. And so it's interesting, folks will say, Dan, so do you, do you trust people? No, especially the one in the mirror. Absolutely not. My trust is in the Lord and what he's accomplishing in his people. And so we, we've got to do good, clear-headed thinking from the word of God about the character of man. Because, beloved, we could sit down and I could give you a huge list of many of the social ills that we are watching right now that disturb us. And it's all going to go back to Genesis chapter 3. And so when people say, oh man, what's the cause of this? Why would people be so dumb? How could somebody think that? Why would they vote for this guy, that guy? Why would they? All those why questions come back to, this is a fallen world. You're living in a fallen world. And it saves you a thousand woes in your understanding of mankind and of your Bible when you let chapter 3 and what the Bible says about the fall really sink into your understanding of who mankind is. So, now if you would look at um, the curse. I'll buzz through this really quick. The Lord God said to the serpent, verse 14, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The promise here uh, is a it's a prophecy and a promise that there is a curse on the snake, there's a curse on Satan, there's a curse on the woman, there's a curse on the man, and all are now sinful, born that way, 
and all will die. Death is now a part of everybody's living existence. And there's great labor pain for the woman. The man will work at the sweat of his brow. And again, beloved, this is what's so cool about, about being a believer and having the word is before you're a Christian, you, you look around, and you guys see this. I'm sure you see this. For some of you who got saved later in life, this is probably clearer to you than it is to me. Um, but before you get saved, you look around, and you're trying to find answers for that which you find, right? You look around the world, and you see, why, why on earth are they so against authority? Why does everybody hate authority? And I'm speaking, say, as an unbeliever. Why does everybody hate authority? Why are they undermining parents? Why are they undermining law enforcement? Why, why are they going after gender? What a weird thing to go just go after. Why are they, why are they, why are they? And everybody's trying to reach out for an answer for why is this, um, the, the tactic that, that's going on around here, why is this so prevalent? They come to Christ and you start reading the word and you go, oh, they're against God. They're against the Lord. He created them male and female. Not only that, look, look at this, that there's authority put in place by God, Romans 13. Not only that, but we see that parents should raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We see the parents as the authority over the kids, not the kids over the parents. Even to the point that we see law enforcement, they don't bear the sword in vain. They're there on purpose by God to punish evil. And over and over and over again, beloved, this is what's so cool is, is the Lord gives you this incredible decoder ring that as you look out at the world, you go, this is all making sense. And, and the interesting part is not that you're some arrogant know-it-all, but it is breathtaking to, to finally see from God's view to some extent what the nature of man is up to, what's in their heart, why they're so angry about these particular things, and how all that goes back to attach that it's, in a, it's against the Lord. And so, beloved, be careful when you chase political stuff, social ills, all that kind of thing. Be careful if you go to answer those without the word. The word should be what you're looking through to understand and decipher what's taking place in your world. Far too often, we just go with our own natural reasoning. We say, well, that's weird, because I thought, well, maybe you're wrong, but go back to the Word. Let the Word be the lens you're looking through as you look at what's happening in this world. And I, I just, I promise you, I know that you will clearly see it from His, from his Word. Verse 15, I'm out of time. The promised salvation, the proto-evangelium, this is the first statement of the gospel truth. That the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of Satan. Now it's interesting, the woman doesn't have a seed. And so some folks think that this is uh, looking forward to the virgin birth. Certainly could be. I don't know. My brother-in-law Charlie's here. You can ask him that. <laughs> The woman does not have a seed, so it's perhaps foretelling to the virgin birth. Much like how the seed of Abraham refers to Jesus, so does this seed. This is so cool when you, when you start to connect the dots of your Old Testament scriptures and you see that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of Satan, and then the seed of Abraham will bless every family, and then the seed of David. You, I wonder if it's the same guy. Satan's... Uh, or this seed, singular, not plural, Galatians chapter 3.16. You can just write that down. I just encourage you to go there. Abraham makes the point that the seed of Abraham, it's singular, not plural, referencing to Christ. That is the inerrant, in inspired interpretation of what was being said back in Genesis. That's the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying when it was told Abraham, the seed, your seed, he's saying that is Christ. Now, look at the enmity that's going to be here. It says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. This is Satan and the woman. So between mankind and Satan himself. And between your offspring and her offspring. The offspring of Eve and the offspring of Satan. Folks argue about what the offspring of Satan is. And I think it's a worthy debate because I don't think it's very clear exactly. 
Some folks say, well, that's demons. Uh, it's tough to argue that demons are the offspring of Satan. You won't find that in the New Testament very clearly. Some folks say fallen humans. Because remember in John chapter 8 where Jesus said, you are of your father the devil? Now that's harsh, right? I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. That was a reference he made to humans in John chapter 8. One brother brought this to my mind years ago and said one Another thing that is here that is a seed from the devil or from sin is death. And death is going to be crushed as well. I just see all that and I say, amen. I don't know exactly what exactly the seed of Satan is. Um, but I do know this. That the seed of the woman will destroy the seed of Satan. He'll bruise his heel, meaning he'll be harmed which I believe is referencing to the cross. Jesus is going to suffer, just like when Simeon told, told Mary that there's going to be a sword that's going to pierce your heart. You're going to suffer as you watch what happens to this baby. But in his temporary pain, he will destroy the enemy. This peace to the curse is a promised blessing found in Jesus Christ to come in the future. This was the incredible hope in the midst of tragedy. It's hard to ponder the hopeless nature of the thinking of Adam and Eve in that moment prior to this. Because all they know is the moment you eat of it, you're done. What kind of hopeless, crushing emotion ran through their mind and heart prior to this? But now they've been promised that your seed will crush his seed. There is a future. There is a promise. Now we know later he provides clothing for them, and, and we see God show great grace. So, beloved, after this, no longer do we, now I'm flashing forward, when we're in heaven... We will not simply know our Lord as creator. He is now creator and redeemer. He's the one who created us. He's the one who sacrificed himself on our behalf. And he's the one who has adopted us. He's the one who has redeemed us. So think of the boost in relationship with Almighty God from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 to Revelation 22. And all the human history and all the redemptive history between those two. It's astounding to think that I know my God as my Father, Creator, Redeemer. All because He in His marvelous grace decided to do that. I have never once seen anybody or heard anybody say that God sent His Son because I was of such great value, and he recognized my value. If anybody were to say that, I'd, I'd stop listening to them, but that is, that is not what we see in the Scripture. Rather, while you were still sinners, Christ sent his son, or God sent his son to die for us. So, let me close with this. How serious do you consider your sin to be? I'm talking to you as a believer. If you're an unsaved person and you're in this building right now, I'm, I'm posing the question to you too, but I'm specifically asking you, believer, this morning. How serious do you take your sin? Mildly? A little, a little bothersome every now and again? Every single sin that has transpired kicked off with this one sin. And you go, what was the sin? They ate a piece of fruit. You're going, that's it? That's not that big of a deal. Well, you tell God that. Because God is the one who said, I have provided everything for you. Stay away from this one. No. Your word does not suffice, and I will take this action. And now we look at the ruin, right? How many sins this week did you take seriously, to that level of seriousness? believer.
it overwhelms. At times, at times, sin can physically make us ill when we think about what we think before God. This text never ceases to confront me with the truth of how my sin offends a holy God. This one act of Adam altered absolutely everything. Sin is of so great an offense to God that blood must be shed for the payment. And here's a big one. Eternal hell is the payment for sin due to God's absolute perfect holiness and justice. So eternal hell is the judgment for sin and the murder and the absorption of the wrath of God on Christ is what was paid for sin. So you tell me, how serious does God take our sin? Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, actually came to earth and was crucified and absorbed Dan Mason's penalty. Beloved, there was a penalty that I, I should pay. I should pay it. And I will never taste the wrath of God. Our Father, Lord, I am I'm at a loss for words, Lord, to express how grateful I am to you for what you've done. And Lord, the fallen humanity, God, you and your grace called me out from it. I am a called out one. And so, dear God, I pray that as we look at the magnificent unity of the Scriptures, that all the way back here in chapter 3, verse 15 of Genesis, there is the sweet promise of the Son of God who will come and accomplish the needed redemption. Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in this building this morning. And I ask of you, Lord God, with so many things, so many distractions and things that can attack us and take our hearts and our minds away. Oh, Father, I pray that the truth of the gospel would come forefront. Dear Father God, that we would be freshly struck in awe at our salvation. Renew us, dear God. Refresh to our memories who we are now in your precious Son. In his name I pray. Amen. Um, Andrew and Sasha Wastey are with us this morning. And uh, you want to close in prayer after this last song? You can sure. say no, but everyone's watching, so <laughs> probably want to say yes. Would you please stand and join with us in our closing hymn, Joy to the World. <clears throat> Yeah.
Good to see everyone. Let's pray. Father, your word is so true and so sweet and precious to us. And I pray that as we are getting closer to Christmas, that we would truly focus on the gift of salvation and what it is to us believers, and that we would be bold to proclaim it to those that we truly love. And thank you for the joy that comes in salvation. Thank you for this church and this congregation to be with. And may we think about the words that we've heard today, that you have a plan, a purpose, and you are the only true Redeemer. And it's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.